another week, another co-host struck down with Omicron. Are we sure that you didn't give me coronavirus via Skype? Because I spent a lot of my week on video calls with you, Dominic, and now here I am, trapped in my apartment with the C-word. Well, one of our producers also got it, so it's a possibility. Team Europeans has had a bad week. It's a podemic. Only Wojciech, our other producer, is uninfected right now. He actually seemed quite cross with us all for how infected we were. He was like, stop having COVID, all of you. It's not my fault. I think he just felt left out. Anyway, you're done with isolation now. What's it like out there in the free world? Oh, it's great. I mean, I have a total irrational sense of invincibility, at least this week. And I know it doesn't mean I'm invincible, but it's really nice. You're going around licking people? Uh, yeah, a little bit of licking. My sympathies with the people of Amsterdam. Um, before we get on with this week's show, there's obviously one elephant in the room this week, and that is what is happening in Ukraine right now. It's a really fast-moving situation, and we weren't really sure how to talk about it on the show this week in a way that wouldn't get overtaken by events just as soon as we released this episode. It is terrifying what's happening right now, and we all know who is responsible for it. I can't even imagine what it feels like right now for the people of Ukraine. So we're sending all of our love and support to those of you there and those of you whose loved ones are there. But for now, we're going to turn our attention to a couple of the other things that have been happening on the continent this week. Uh, Dominic, what's coming up on this week's show? We're going to be having a conversation about the state of the live music sector in Europe. I think everyone by now knows that it's been a pretty tough few years for many industries, but live music has been hit particularly hard. As venues are opening up again, we're going to be joined by Elise Famger, who works at an organisation we've partnered with before called Live Europe. They are a platform that helps music venues promote the diversity of the European music scene. Elise will also be joined by the Swiss pop musician Janine Catrain, who is a member of the amazing band Black Sea Dahu. We'll be speaking to them both later on in the show, but first. <laughs> Who's had a good week? Uh, I've decided to bend the format slightly and label this not good week, but constructive ideas week. Snappy, isn't it? It just rolls off the tongue. It's cheating. I don't care. I'm doing it anyway. Um, I wanted to talk about this report that's just come out from a group of academics and activists who were asked by the regional government of Brussels to figure out how to deal with the monuments of Belgium's colonial past, which are dotted around the Brussels region. Visitors to Brussels, including myself, have often been pretty shocked to see this big statue of King Leopold II in the city centre. Uh, if you know anything about Belgium's colonial history... It's always felt very jarring to have this very prominent statue of Leopold there presented without comment, like no sign explaining what he did. I guess you've probably been past that statue too. It's the big one of him on a horse. I really don't know Brussels other than like Brussels Midi, so I'm not sure I actually have. This is your regular reminder that this is not a Brussels bubble podcast. We're yeah, from exactly. non-Brussels Europe. Um, but yeah, a quick recap for those of you who might not be familiar with this part of Belgium's history. The huge part of Central Africa that is DR Congo today, that land was under Belgian rule for about eight decades up until 1960. And for the first two of those decades, King Leopold personally owned this country. It was run purely for his personal profit. And even by the standards of the horrific things that European colonists were doing at the time, the Congo Free State is notorious for how much people suffered. Millions of Congolese people were worked to death in the name of making Leopold rich. Plantation managers would cut off people's limbs or their kids' limbs if they couldn't meet their production quotas for things like rubber and ivory. It was so cruel, in fact, that in 1908, the other European colonial powers actually intervened and said that Leopold couldn't be allowed to rule like this. And the state, the Belgian state, eventually took it over. Fast forward to 2020, the Black Lives Matter protests are sweeping across the world after the horrific death of George Floyd in the US. And in Europe, these protests focus not just on racism and discrimination today, but also the fact that European countries profited hugely from colonising other countries and their involvement in the slave trade. And so in various countries, including Britain and France and Belgium, people turn to statues of prominent colonisers and slave traders and they point out that the fact that these statues are all over our streets, it's a really potent symbol of the way that European society just doesn't really confront this history. So if you take King Leopold, for example, 
Lots of Belgians learned about him in school as the Roi Batisseur, the Builder King, because he used a lot of the wealth from Congo to build things at home, like these big, beautiful arches in Brussels, and to renovate palaces. And even though King Philippe, the Belgian king, he acknowledged during the Black Lives Matter protests that terrible things did happen during the colonial period, he stopped short of apologising. And this common narrative of Leopold being like a builder and a great figure rather than someone responsible for literally millions of African deaths, it goes a little way to explaining how it was really normalized to have loads of statues and busts of Leopold, like just in the streets. So I am now remembering this big statue of Leopold. Is it one of the ones that was vandalized or even taken down during the Black Lives Matter protests? Yeah, so some other statues of Leopold got taken down in Antwerp and Ghent, among other places. The big one in Brussels of him on a horse, uh, it got graffitied. And it wasn't for the first time. People have been spray painting various statues of Leopold for years in protest that he is mostly uncritically memorialised in public spaces within Belgium. And there really is quite a lot of Leopold in public. There are squares named after him, there are streets... It's also not just Leopold. Uh, The newspaper Le Soir did an audit of public landmarks named after colonial figures in Brussels, streets, metro stations, and they counted at least 70. And so in Brussels during the Black Lives Matter protests the summer before last, more and more people started caring about this for the first time. And eventually nearly 85,000 people signed a petition demanding that the city of Brussels take down all statues of Leopold. And is that what this report recommends that they do to take them down? Uh, No, and that's why I think it's interesting. Uh, It's a really long report, 256 pages, and these historians and architects and activists from the Congolese community, they spent 15 months writing it. And I think what they wrote was actually pretty thoughtful in the end. Uh, But they came out against taking down all of these statues. The report says that a decolonized public space is not a space in which all colonial traces have been effaced. They're arguing that the point is not to pretend that this history didn't happen. It's about remembering it more appropriately. And so they suggested that these monuments should be looked at on a case-by-case basis with a few different options for what to do with them. So some statues could just have a plaque added to explain the context of what this person did. Other monuments could be put in museums. There was also this idea of creating a new museum where people can learn about Belgium's colonial history, maybe something a little bit like the Citadel Museum in Berlin, which tries to put all of these old symbols of German power into context, including things from the Nazi and communist eras. Uh, For the big statue of Leopold in Brussels, though, the experts did suggest something a little bit more drastic, and that is to melt it down and turn it into a new monument in tribute to the victims of colonisation. Wow. How's that gone down? Yeah, it depends who you ask. Uh, Let me give you a taste of how the report got discussed on Belgian TV over the weekend. You don't need to speak French to get a gist of the tone. The thing I find really interesting about statues is that we've been seeing quite similar emotional debates in various European countries that used to have empires. Um, If you're listening to this from the UK, you'll have drawn an instant comparison with the statue of the slave trader Edward Colston, which got chucked into the Bristol Harbour during the Black Lives Matter protests. And how you felt about the statue being ripped down somehow became this kind of cultural shorthand for this divide in Britain over how we remember the British Empire. You've got one side accusing the other of being apologists for this racist project that has left a really, really deep legacy on like a quarter of the planet. Mm. And you've got the other side saying, you know, we shouldn't have to apologize for stuff that happened a century ago. And why are you social justice warriors so negative about Britain all the time? We're a great country that's achieved great things. And whether you're in Belgium or in Britain, this debate gets incredibly angry and emotional. It's tapped into some really, really deep cultural insecurities. And in Belgium, some people on the political right have not welcomed these ideas for how to deal with these statues. One Brussels MP, Gaetan van Hoytenhoven, he said that melting down the statue and turning it into a new one would be vandalism in disguise. He also didn't like the idea of moving the statue to somewhere less prominent. He said he didn't want Brussels to create what he called a depot of rejected monuments. 
I have to say, I find this idea of moving statues into different places quite an interesting one. Mm. I was reading about these statue parks that have been set up in some former Soviet countries like Hungary and Lithuania, because after the Soviet period, people found it traumatizing, of course, to just have all of these really visible public reminders of Soviet rule, like celebrating the Soviet Union as, as something really great in their town squares. And the Memento Park in Budapest, where they moved a couple of dozen of these statues, it's not in the city center. It's on the edge of town. And the fact that it's not something that people have to look at all the time is something that's allowed people to not necessarily have to think about it all the time if they don't want to. Which, if you think about a city like Brussels, where there's reminders of colonialism kind of sprinkled around the place, I reckon moving through a landscape like that feels different if you're Belgian Congolese than if you are this you know, white MP who thinks it would be a shame if we didn't get to see Leopold on his horse all the time. So what's going to actually happen with these recommendations like are any of these recommendations going to be put into practice? Well, Pascal Smet, who's the region's urban planning minister, he has promised that this report is not going to languish on a shelf somewhere. And he's hoping to publish an action plan by September and start taking decisions on what to do with individual monuments at the end of the year. The big statue of Leopold on the horse is actually owned by the Belgian federal government. So they'll get the final decision on what happens to it. But there's clearly going to have to be a longer debate about that one because quite a few politicians do not like this idea of melting it down and turning it into a new statue. But it'll be really interesting to see what Brussels decides to do with these suggestions. They're not the only local authority in Europe wrestling with this. Uh, Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, has also ordered a review of the city's landmarks to try to make them celebrate a more diverse range of people. And you should have seen the Twitter comments on the announcements that this was a thing that he was doing. Statues. I mean, like, who knew that this is the thing that would be really getting people's juices going in Britain in 2022? Mm. Uh, But actually, on that note, I've got an early recommendation for you. Uh, I recently finished the book Empire Land by Satham Sanghera, which is a very accessible book about how the empire shaped Britain itself and its thinking. Uh, And there's a really, really good chapter about selective amnesia in Britain and this kind of fierce will to be proud of the empire's achievements and sort of sweep the bad bits under the carpet. Uh, Yeah, really recommend it. Oh, I should read it. You should. Who's had a bad week? It's been a bad week for Krzysztof Gochowski, who's the artistic director and chief executive of one of Poland's leading theatres, Juliusz Zwawacki Theatre. He received news this week that the regional authorities have begun a procedure to remove him from his post. And he and his supporters are accusing the ruling Law and Justice Party of pushing him out of his position because of a specific play that was staged at this theatre recently that wasn't to the liking of the Conservatives in power. That sounds grim. Um, what what was this play? Um, it's a very famous piece of Polish drama called Diady, known in English as Forefathers' Eve. And it was written by Poland's celebrated poet, Adam Mickiewicz, in the 19th century. It's actually a trilogy of plays that in essence looks at the trauma of Poland losing independence. The play actually triggered a protest movement back in 1968 when the communist regime decided to ban it because it was seen as having anti-Russian sentiments. So it's pretty striking that this play is again upsetting the authorities and perhaps even more striking that the Law and Justice Party, who on the surface are the most anti-communist party on the planet, is being accused of trying to censor exactly the same piece that was upsetting communists. That's quite weird that they would find themselves in the same boat. Like, how did we get here? Well, I was speaking to our producer Wojciech about it. He's Polish. And he said that with this play, there is just so much that can and is read between the lines. There is so much room for interpretation. He said that he's seen totally contradictory interpretations of particular scenes. Mm. And I guess that's also probably why it's so popular, if it can be reinterpreted to fit the problems of the day, and also why it can be so controversial, because you can not like how it's been interpreted. So the authorities aren't opposed to the play in general. I don't think they would dare turn against this beloved Polish text. It's one of those pieces that just about everyone knows as it's one of the set texts you study over many years in both primary school and high school at school in Poland. Mm. The Law and Justice Party officials are opposed to this specific production because of the way it was modernized at the theater in Krakow. The show included references to the Catholic Church, to the protests following the near total ban on abortion, and even to Poland's ongoing conflicts with the EU. So it was quite a political 
production. Mm. We know that the Law and Justice Party are definitely angry about this production because they have said so explicitly. The education minister called the play a desecration of art. And the head of a local education board urged schools not to take children to see this play. Gohovsky, this artistic director whose job is under threat, he said in a TV interview that they felt under pressure at the theatre as soon as the show opened, but that he didn't imagine it would move so quickly and that it would lead to attempts to remove him. I mean, even if they didn't like the play, presumably the authorities are not saying super openly, like, yeah, we've got rid of him because we hate this play. Yeah, exactly. They're not saying it that openly. They allege that he has broken some procurement regulations, an allegation that he and the staff say lacks any fact or legal grounds. But the authorities are also saying that he failed to care for the good name of the theatre, something that many are reading as a not very veiled criticism of the staging of this play at the end of last year. Mm. And the theatre staff have launched a protest last week in opposition to the moves to remove Gohovsky. A big banner read, the theatre is ours, and staff said in a statement that they were deeply concerned with the decision. Gohovsky himself said, we're witnessing culture dying. It's all about the independence of art and freedom of artistic expression. I know it's sometimes tempting to look away from conflicts like this, to just put it in that box of, oh yeah, yet another culture war battle. But I think it's important to look at the context within which this decision is made. This is just one example in a big pattern of concerning behavior from the Law and Justice Party, who are now pretty regularly finding ways to replace directors of cultural and heritage organizations with people who are in many situations just frankly more conservative and therefore more likely to please them. There was a really clear example when the Minister of Culture appointed a new director of the National Museum in Warsaw back in 2019. This guy was criticised for having very limited experience at running a cultural institution. And perhaps unsurprisingly, chaos ensued in the institution following his arrival, resulting in about 50 resignations, including the museum's top experts. One of the first things to change when this guy took over was that a statue of Pope John Paul II was placed in front of the museum. It was a rather controversial, meme-provoking, strange and ambiguous piece of art with John Paul II holding a rock over his head while standing in a red pool. (laughs) But many critics interpreted it as a signal from this new director that he wanted to please Poland's ultra-Catholic government. Sounds like quite a rebellious statue. What's he doing holding a rock? Yeah, other people did also interpret it as rebellious, but I have no idea what he was doing holding a rock. We'll probably never know. But the criticism of contentious appointments for key positions is pretty widespread across many institutions, including the National Film Archive and Audiovisual Institute. There was also a recent appointment of a very conservative person for the post of the director of the most progressive gallery in Warsaw, Zahinta. So the Law and Justice Party's influence in cultural institutions just seems to be getting deeper and deeper each year. And these are just the more high profile examples I'm listing here. Ugh, oh, man, this is depressing. And this isn't just something that's happening in Poland, right? Like I think we talked a while back about how in Hungary, the Orban government were, I think, accused of trying to take over the Film and Theatre Academy or something. Yeah, I thought about that situation when I heard about this situation. And It makes me think that it's really solidified to be part of the playbook for these illiberal leaders. There's also a lot of concern in the UK right now about the future of one of the most important journalistic and cultural institutions we have, the BBC. The culture minister recently froze the BBC's funding and the future of the license fee, the funding mechanism that funds the BBC, is in doubt. Many critics of the British government think that the government are doing this because the BBC is perceived as being too left-wing, an accusation that is at least at part rebutted by the fact that most of left-wing Britain think that the BBC is too (laughs) right-wing. They're doing something right if everyone hates them. Absolutely. But all of this is to say that art and culture are important for democracy. Art has always been free when democracies are functioning properly. Art works as a mirror for our society, for our politics, for our lives, and it helps bring awareness to the complex issues and stories of our society. Actually, someone who was much better at explaining why art is so important than me was the late, great Polish theatre maker Jerzy Grotowski. Here's how he explained it. Why do we sacrifice so much energy to our art? Not in order to teach others, 
but to learn with them what our existence, our organism, our personal and repeatable experiences have to give us, to learn to break down the barriers which surround us and to free ourselves from the breaks which hold us back, from the lies about ourselves which we manufacture daily for ourselves and for others, to destroy the limitations caused by our ignorance or lack of courage, in short, to fill the emptiness in us, to fulfill ourselves. Art is a ripening, an evolution, an uplifting, which enables us to emerge from darkness into a blaze of light. We got a lovely message this week from one of our new Patreon supporters, Ava L. Uh, she wrote that she'd started listening to the podcast during her COVID isolation in Germany. And uh, and that's how she got hooked, which got me thinking, this podcast is an excellent thing to recommend to anyone doing COVID isolation right now. Because we've got a big back catalogue after doing this for a few years now. Uh, Ava's got through a year's worth already. Uh, so why not recommend this podcast to your friend with COVID? They can just lie there, being educated and entertained at the same time. If you didn't have COVID yourself right now, I would say this is very opportunistic. I could listen to us myself, but that would be a very weird way to spend my time. Um, Anyway, uh, suggesting this podcast to your COVID-infected friend is just one way to support us. The other is to be like Ava and this week's other very generous supporters, Julie Laurent, Monica Pavlovska and Julia Lagana. Thank you all so much for signing up to give us a monthly donation so that we can keep making this podcast. Yes, thank you all. You can head to patreon.com forward slash Europeans podcast to join that club. Please do. Last week, I confidently said that I was going to a gig that weekend. Mm. Mm. (laughs) That didn't happen, uh, which feels fairly symbolic, given that this week's interview is about how Europe's live music industry is doing right now. Both of us love live music. Dominic does it as a job, in fact, when he's not making this podcast. Uh, How's that been, this pandemic, for you, Dominic? Yeah, it's been hard, although I realise I'm also lucky in a way because I had some fixed contract. So yeah, I'm one of the lucky ones. And I also think it's maybe been even worse for pop venues because standing up venues have often been closed for longer than venues like theatres and opera houses that I perform in where people can be slightly more easily distanced. Seats or no seats, it has been a very weird time for live music. And the situation is still really different across Europe in terms of what is allowed and what's not allowed and what kind of support musicians and venues are getting. So we wanted to take the industry's pulse, basically. And we've got two guests joining us to do that this week. The good people at Live Europe work with some of the most fun music venues in Europe, everywhere from Milkveg in Amsterdam to A38 in Budapest. You won't remember that they've kindly given us previously a bunch of tickets to our listeners for various shows over the past year or so. Their coordinator, Elise Famja, is here to give us the lowdown, along with the lead singer of mine and Dominic's current band crush, Black Sea Dahu. They are from Zurich. They play gorgeous indie folk music. I've had them on repeat all week. And their singer, Shanine Ketrein, joined us for a chat with Elise. You're the lead singer of a band that always seems to be performing live, at least before the pandemic. I think I read that you had performed 140 shows in 2019. Is that right? It sounds like too many shows in one year. But how was it for you when the pandemic hit? It was really strange at first because you go from playing almost every day to being at home looking at your apartment for the first time in your life, like really, like what is hanging on the walls? Nothing's in the fridge. Everyday life hits you very hard. Also, we kind of lost touch in the band. And before we saw each other every day, we were super close, everyone in one bus all the time. On one hand, it was nice because we could relax for once and just slow down. On the other hand, you fall. It's like you're falling in the space of nothingness and you can't plan anything. You're always 
trying to plan something, you have to rehearse all the time, but then it's going to be cancelled again. So you're in constant stress. The best example is that we planned our studio time in a time where we actually had a tour. So we just thought, oh, it's going to be cancelled probably. So we're going to plan it in this time frame. And the tour was eventually was cancelled so we could go to the studio. But it's just the thought of this, it's insane. And to what extent do you feel like your performing career is kind of back to normal now? I don't think it is back to normal. People have to wear masks. There's not enough people in the venues so that it's financially stable for everyone involved. The routings of the tours are not great because it's all postponed tours that we just have to do. And they're actually from like 2020. You have to test all the time. Everyone has to be vaccinated. It's not back to normal, not yet. The life in the backstage is back to normal. (laughs) But everything else is still insane. I'm glad that the backstage life is back at least. Um, <laughs> and like, I'm trying to get an idea of what things are looking like across the continent. Are there kind of different rules and different restrictions still depending on where you are in Europe? If you take the last wave of COVID we had at the end of last year, Austria, for example, was one of the first countries to close venues again. And then it all felt again like in a domino effect. Now we start to see the the light at at the end of the tunnel, but it's still quite challenging for the live sector, for touring artists. Yeah, I think it's really going to take a long time for the live music sector to recover. And when we think, especially at EU level of public support action we create, and we're really in a situation where to help the European music scene blossom again, it's essential that the EU invests more actively in it and that's facilitating the touring circuits so that you know the rules can be more harmonized from one country to another, facilitating the touring by more financial incentives, whether it's for the venues or also for actions for, for artists. I don't know, Shanine, if you want to add something. I only have a, an example like from right out of the touring life which was when we played in Holland. We went there, we played the show, and on the same day, the government of Holland decided to close. That is the essential thing that is happening for two years now. It's you go and play, but it could be that on the same day, the whole city or country is closing, and you could play this last note, and then on 12, the doors close, and everyone goes home and is crying. It's just up and down. It's really anything can happen. You just have to be prepared all the time. I've heard this argument that if COVID is going to hang around and if it makes things more tricky in the autumn and winter months, which it seems to sometimes do, then maybe we should not expect to be able to go to gigs during the winter. Um, And it's this idea that it should become a seasonal industry. What do you think about that argument that we might only be able to perform in warmer months? Well, I don't know how we can survive with just playing six months in the year. I mean, (laughs) we played 140 shows and we can't go on like this. It's like we said, okay, this year we're going to do 100 tops, but we need to play as much as this because we need the money. We are musicians. We need to play live to earn money. So if we can only play six months, then we would have to play every day to just make the same amount of money that we make in a year. Or we would just have to get more royalties or whatever. (laughs) So, I mean, then everything else has to change. But it would be nice because you can produce music in the other six months. So it's not all bad, the idea. You could find yourself like a nice hut in you know sweden or somewhere by a nice river and like yeah. make a beautiful album <laughs> i'm making it sound really idealistic i think it sounds really hard i'm trying to put myself in the like shoes of somebody who runs a venue at a time like this are they having to be more cautious in who they book because revenues are down like are they less likely for example to take a bet on up-and-coming artists right now if you take the live music sector we saw that there was a 90 percent decrease in revenue because of the pandemic so if you do the math taking more risks to book say uh, an emerging european artist is uh, maybe not the most sustainable solution you will have the problems that were happening before in the european music sector are still there, they're even exacerbated, but we see that with just a bit of seed funding from the EU, you can have 
substantial results when you try to facilitate that circulation of new European artists in music venues. One of the things that you did, Shanine, during the pandemic was that you got to do a residency in Lille with the support of Live Europe, which meant that you were there for an extended period of time, which is, I guess, quite different to playing a one night show somewhere and then moving on. Do you think it's a helpful thing for musicians to be able to do this kind of residency? Very. It was very nice. When you're on tour, it's nice to be in another city every day, but it's also sad because you don't see anything and you never get to have the time to really play the music just in peace. When we were in Lille, we did like three or four live sessions. We produced a lot of stuff. We were really creative and we could just be together in this big house. We wake up at eight, everyone is going to eat breakfast. We go to Lille together, to Leronef, and then we rehearse and we're out of there by five. And it was just really nice because when you're a musician, so often you rehearse until 11 in the night and your energy is gone. It felt like we had an everyday job. <laughs> we really did get so much done. It was really nice. It sounds very un-rock and roll though. Breakfast at eight o'clock. <laughs> It is not rock and roll to be a musician anymore. <laughs> it's hard work. Oh, man. Um, you have a new album coming out today on the day that this podcast comes out. It is getting rave reviews already. And Ooh. I read that it's based on snippets that you wrote while you were touring, while you were traveling. How different do you think this album would be if you hadn't been able to travel? I wouldn't be writing so much about touring. I think touring is a big theme in my lyrics in that I'm always tired. And I write about that a lot in the lyrics, like I'm exhausted and and that I'm trying to understand what people really want that stand in the crowd because I sometimes I felt alienated when I was standing on stage and everyone is looking at you and I thought, what do you see? What did you pay for? Am I really what, what you want to see? But also I think I would have got the album done way sooner. So like two years ago in interviews, I said, yeah, of course I can write when I'm on tour. It's no problem. <laughs> and then I just saw myself getting tired when COVID hit. Like for one or two weeks, I did nothing. I just watched Netflix. I cooked meals. I haven't cooked <laughs> in months, you know. <laughs> and then I looked at all these notes that I made and uh, memos of chords and everything, ideas. And I pretty much got in a very creative state. It needs focus to do that. So I think it would have taken not so long if I wasn't on, hadn't been on tour so much. Elise, what, what do you think policymakers and people with power should be doing to make sure that we can keep making great music on this continent? I think um, there's so many examples of new European talents that have really made their way and become much bigger and even took over the world in terms of uh, what impact they had on the culture from a much longer time ago. You can go all the way up to ABBA, but you can also think of Stromae, who's going to go to Coachella soon. Or I mean, there's so many talents that are there and I think it's important that policymakers do realize the added value that financial support to the European music sector, to the European cultural ecosystem can have. We see through all the projects that are funded by Creative Europe that they can really have exponential impact. And at a time when COVID has really had such a huge impact on the cultural sector, we should really not forget culture and really finance and invest adequately in it. We're not even into this week's isolation inspiration, but I couldn't wait to give you a recommendation. And that is that you go listen to Black Sea Dahu's new album, I Am My Mother. It is out today, Thursday, and it is getting glowing reviews already. Go check it out. (laughs) 
Give us some isolation inspiration, Katie. Well, actually, my first recommendation of the week leads on from the interview you just heard, because when I haven't been listening to Black Sea Dahu this week, I've been playing Live Europe's playlist of up-and-coming European acts. There is some great stuff on there. I've been having a little solo COVID isolation dance party while clearing out my kitchen cupboards. (laughs) That playlist is available on Spotify. It's available on Deezer. It's on YouTube. I will post the link in the show notes. And actually, I had another list that I wanted to mention, uh, which is a list of recent Ukrainian literature that's available in English. It was posted on Twitter by Ulyan Blacker, who's a Ukraine scholar. And he wrote, anyone who wants to understand what Russia has put Ukraine through over the past eight years should read the new Ukrainian war literature. There are novels and novellas in the list about the absurdity of the war and language and identity in Ukraine, poems too, memoirs and a play. Uh, And at this very grim time for Ukraine, I really recommend that you check it out. Hmm. What have you been enjoying this week? Well, unlike you, I am back out in the world again. And theatres are open. So my culture is becoming more local again, which is really lovely, but also not great for recommendations unless you happen to live in the Netherlands. But one of the shows I saw this week has more of an international context and availability. So I thought I'd talk about that. It was part of a festival that's going on in Amsterdam at the moment, celebrating the work of the prodigious 20-something-year-old writer, Edouard Louis. Oh. Yeah. Imagine having a whole two-week festival celebrating your work whilst you're still in your 20s. It's going to happen to us one day, Dominic. Sure. Perhaps not in our 20s. Edouard Louis' autobiographical novels have been translated into dozens of languages, adapted for theatre numerous times successfully, and one book is even about to get the Netflix treatment, I believe. But I went to see Edouard perform one of his books as a theatrical monologue himself. The performance is based on his book, Qui a tué mon père, or Who Killed My Father. And it's an intensely personal piece about his complex relationship with his father. But he also uses his incredible knack for storytelling to point the fingers at specific politicians for pushing his father further and further into poverty, ill health and misery. And in a grand climax of the piece, he literally hangs up pictures of some ministers and four presidents of France, Macron, Hollande, Sarkozy and Chirac. And he asserts which specific policies from each president have contributed to making his father's life more miserable Mm. and have contributed to the worsening of his health. He accuses them of not having a clue what life is like for someone living in poverty like his father. I found it really moving watching his performance. And to bring it back to what I was talking about in Bad Week, it was just a really stark example for me about why theatre and art can be so important and how important good storytelling is for holding our leaders to account and improving society. Edouard performs it sporadically around the world, and it might sound really heavy, but there's also some Britney Spears lip syncing in it. Um, Mm. So keep an eye out for it. But in the meantime, I recommend reading the book that this performance is based on. It's only 84 pages, and he covers really difficult topics, but in a very readable way. It's Edouard Louis' Who Killed My Father. So I've got a happy ending that I just decided I think maybe is a bit boring. (laughs) But I'm going to give it a go and see whether it makes you happy. Can't wait to hear it. So it's a transcontinental story to close off this week's show. Um, Some middle school students in New Hampshire launched a small boat out into the ocean in late 2020. With the help of their teachers, they decorated it with artwork and filled it with a GPS tracker. Mm, Fancy boat. And that GPS tracker wasn't quite as reliable as you might have hoped. So the boat's journey was difficult to track in the end. For quite long periods, the GPS went completely dark. Then, back in hurricane season, the GPS started working again and showed the boat was quite close to Ireland. It had made an entire Atlantic crossing from New Hampshire... Sadly, they then lost it again until 462 days into the journey, a child stumbled across the boat whilst out on a small island off the coast of Norway. Wow. The child collected the boat, which wasn't in the best condition. Its heel and cull were gone and it was covered in barnacles. But he took it to his own school to open up the boat with his classmates. And now a call is being arranged between the two schools, which I imagine is a very magical experience. Oh, that's not a boring story at all. So many 
twists. It's got the makings of an Ed Waluigi novel. No, it doesn't. We will be back next week, loaded up with antibodies. Can't wait to get out there and lick some nap posts. In the meantime, I'm still mostly on the internet because I've got nowhere else to go. Um, so come and find us on Twitter at EuropeansPod and Instagram at EuropeansPodcast. Thank you to Katie Lee and Wojciech Oleksiak for producing this week's show. Our other producer, Katz Laszlo, is off making something very exciting. We are members of the Are We Europe audio family. You can go and check out their other audio offerings at areweeurope.eu forward slash audio dash family. See you next week, everyone. Auf Wiedersehen.